Good morning again. Happy Sabbath. Good morning, Sabbath. I ran across a couple things on uh, on the internet the other day, and I'd like to have you listen to them. It says, we are not human beings having a, six, a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Sometimes I think we forget about that. Then there was another one that says, when asked how they managed to stay married for 65 years, the woman replied, we were born in a time where if something was broke, you fixed it, not throw it away. Finally, be someone that makes you happy. That one takes a little bit of thought. Be someone that makes you happy. My, uh, my talk this morning is titled, Bushel Baskets. So we bow our heads. Most loving Heavenly Father, we come to you at this moment to give thanks again for all your blessings, to let you know that we are aware of what we are supposed to be doing here and spreading your love to those around us. Whether, no matter, our likes or our dislikes, they are your children, and we need to respect that and love them for the, who they are. So we ask the Holy Spirit to be present this morning, that the words that I have for you, the congregation will be strictly from Jesus. Guide and direct, we pray in Jesus' name. I'm taking the scripture this morning from Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, and this is from the New American Standard Bible. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. A match meets its potential, or doesn't meet its potential, until somebody strikes it. And then it bursts into flame. Then there is heat, and then there is light. A full box of matches is of no value if its contents are never used. I had a box of matches when we moved here in January. I looked all over for it, but it was somewhere out in the garage, in some, of the, some box somewhere. I can't find it. But it is useless. It's still a box of matches. And it'll never be anything else or never be any good until it is used. <coughs> if I find a box of matches and it's empty and it looks just like the full one, there are 
are some churches, there are some congregations are like that in the box. Pray to the Lord that this congregation never is an empty box. Amen. Also a candle. If I hold up a candle, it may be pretty. It may be a nice color. Christmas time they have green ones. Other times they have different colored ones. But if you don't light it, it's just something to look at. It doesn't do anything. So my prayer is that somebody will light my, light my candle. That I may be of service to someone. A church without Christ's light is a waste of lumber, plaster, and people. And Ellen White says that when the shaking time that God has promised, as in Isaiah's time, it will be obvious which are full boxes and which are empty ones. A side light here, a little, little bit of practical. Part. If you take a wooden matchstick, you can use it even if you don't light it. The way they make cupboards nowadays, they make it out of pressed wood. It's a bunch of sawdust held together by glue. And they use that for kitchen cupboards. Now as you use the door back and forth, sometimes that screw gets loose. And there is nothing you can do with it because there's, there's only glue in there. But if you take that match and you put it in the hole and you break it off even with the surface of the wood, you can put a screw back in there and it works. So don't look bad at somebody if they don't have, if they're not a, a flame. Because you can use it, you can use the other end just as well. I think there's a lot of unnecessary heartbreak and loss of faith in our relationship with God and Jesus because we really don't understand the relationship. God did not put you and me here on earth to make you or me <coughs> look good. God put us here for one reason <coughs> and only one reason. Until we start living that reason, nothing much is going to happen. The reason for our existence is to make God look good, not us. To show everyone that he is capable of making a lousy, I'm talking about myself, a lousy self-centered human being into a lovely, unselfish, loving individual that will yield much fruit. Once you let God mold you into your designated mold, nothing that you wish will be impossible. When you pray, all heaven will listen because you will be praising God. And that is what heaven does when praises reach there. It shouldn't need much faith for us to believe because we have living proof in Christ. And anything, anything 
that makes God and His Son Jesus look good in our prayers that He will always grant. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8, He says, Ask. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks will find. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So why aren't our prayers being answered? I don't know how the rest of you work, but I ask that question a lot of times. Especially in the past when I didn't know where I was going. I think perhaps that what I was talking and asking about wasn't really what I needed. It was what I thought I needed. If your relationship is so weak that you aren't sure God will keep His promise, you're in trouble. You have to trust God with certainty that He will deliver on every single promise that He has made to us. And those promises are found in His Word, in the Bible. Those promises are worthless if you don't ask and receive them. You ask God to heal the unhealable, and then you add a clause to your request that says, perhaps it won't be for that person's ultimate good not to be healed. Where is any faith to be found in a prayer like that? That's like lighting your candle and then putting a bushel basket over it. God surely knows what is good and what is not good for the person we are praying for. So you need to remove the basket and let God decide. We are all aware that sometimes God permits us to die because subsequent trials will cause us to lose our hold on Jesus. But I say, let God take care of that detail. If your faith needs an extra boost, add the following to your prayer, Thy will be done. Get over your doubts and tell God you are ready to receive the promise that He has so lovingly promised you. Faith is a gift. Righteousness is a result of faith, so it is also a gift. Eternal life is a gift. Forgiveness of sins is a gift. And God's promises are gifts. Get over the doubting and start living positive. What is it? Um, positive. I'm sorry. Living positively in the gift of grace. <coughs> Many times we are not in full health. Because we did things that were destructive to our health in the past, and now we're paying the penalty. But 
Mm -hmm. I was young. I couldn't even conceive of being old, let alone worrying about what my health was going to be when I got there. Sometimes I kind of wish I had known that because I had, I'm reaping some of the things that I sowed back then. The only good part is God knows me. God loves me. And even though I'm at fault, he's still supporting me. Amen. Amen. Jesus spent his whole life practically healing people. Jesus healed the lepers. He healed the centurion's servant, Matthew 8. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, pick up your bed, and go home. Matthew 9, 6. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Matthew 10, 8. Back to uh, Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. After Jesus healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law, it says, When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word. And he healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities. He took our sicknesses and carried away our diseases. My question today is, do we really believe that? And if we really believe that, are we asking for it? I don't know how to answer that. Because I think of um, Paul. Paul said, Lord, take away the weakness in my eyes. Heal me. Three times he came to the Lord and said, Heal me. And you know, Paul was a proud Pharisee, brilliant man. And Jesus said, when you are weak, I'll make you strong. And he refused. To the last day, Paul had to have somebody do his writing for him. Why? We're always asking why. Because God knew and if he made Paul 100% well, Paul would have a trouble being humble. And I know about that. It takes a lot to be humble. But I found that once I could be some measure of, of being humble, that it's a freedom of sorts. It gets tiresome being right all the time. <laughs> nobody likes you. After a while, nobody even wants to listen to you. And so you have to try hard. And so that's why God asks us to be humble. 
Why do we need to be humble? Because we have to be united. We have to be one, a, a unity in purpose. This congregation, and we're no different than any of the others, if this congregation wants to put the light, take off the bushel basket, we have to be united in purpose. We don't have to, we don't have to be the same. We have to be united. And I saw this past week on the um, Love Spencer when we were out there. Somebody made a comment. I understood that the Seventh-day Adventists weren't allowed to be in this thing. And somebody says, why not? Because somebody out there doesn't know who we are. Mm -hmm. And if they don't know who we are, how can we be spreading God's light? When was the last time we all got together and prayed for each other. I remember one Sabbath reading, maybe it was Mike, was that you who called us up front when we prayed? That was a great thing. And if you're wondering what it's going to bring us together, it's going to be prayer. And we get together, this light is going to be so bright in this community, that would run up. It's going to explode. You can't imagine what God can do when everybody is together loving Him and each other. I'm going to ask you a tough thing this morning. I'm going to ask you, stand up. Oh, that's right. I was going to do something else. I tried that one day. And back in, uh, I said, I want everybody to stand up. And I want you to turn to two people. Preferably one of them, not your spouse, and tell them and say to them, I love you. I'm going to do that in church one of these days too, so get ready for it. <laughs> it is a surprise what the change will do to you than that simple thing. But today I'm going to ask something else. I'm going to ask you to pick at least two people in this congregation to pray for every day for six months. Starting tomorrow. Two people. You have to make the choice. You can be your spouse. You can even be yourself. Pray for them every day for six months. The same thing, whatever, whatever you, you want them to be, you pray for that. And let's see what happens. After you can pick more than two if you're willing to do it, but I have a, a whole list of things I pray for, so I'm gonna just keep it to the two people. <laughs> Spencer needs to grow in both Christ and in people, and it will never live up to its potential, talking about this church, 
until those belonging to it unite in each other in purpose and in love. I just happened to glance at the clock. It's 12, 12, 10 after 12. <laughs> Preach it. I think I've said enough on this that it gives us a, a kickstart in doing what we need. We're wonderful people here. We are. We love God. Amen. Let's love each other. Let's get together. Let's get a unity. Let's, let's, if, if these two people, for everybody here, we're going to overlap. Maybe it's for somebody that isn't here. The closing song is uh, number 326, Open My Eyes, after which I'll have the benediction and uh, after the benediction I have some more, I have some, uh, something I want to do and I'll take care of it at that time. Shall we, uh, shall we stand for number 326?